What's up, everybody? My name is Scott Waters, and this is Trog. And welcome to No Life Till Metal. <laughs> that was my that was my Mongolian throat singing attempt. <laughs> okay, uh, this is going to be our top twenty five of nineteen seventy one. And top 25, that's paring it down from, we had a good 40 or 50 albums to choose from. Yeah, it's um, just, just a bit much. So we had to crop some out, and we left out two that we wanted to include, um, or at least one. Mm. And we ended up, because we neither one of us had it on vinyl, uh, that oh. would be the very first budgie. budgie. We didn't have it. I had Squawk, which was the one after. Yeah, and I didn't have it on CD or vinyl, so it's not being shown. There's so a, There's a certain point you get to in your collecting, which I'm sure a lot of you will attest to. The collecting and the age are they're both going up and then you used to know everything you had and you knew every every little piece of information about it well guess what <laughs> it starts to wane a little bit i thought i had that record <laughs> or i just bought this record oh crap i already got two copies <laughs> or when did i get this <laughs> exactly i've done that so many times all right right on so we're going to start off with our honorable mentions yeah. and you go first these are all right. not the top 25 this is honorable mentions yeah 1971 important bands uh, that had releases that we just kind of like overlooked, like Argent. I love Argent. Um, not hardcore prog like you know Emerson Lincoln Palmer or Yes, but definitely a, a kinder, gentler kind of prog band. You know, you remember their big hit, Hold Your Head Up. Uh, this was their second album. It was the one right before that one that came that came out right after it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You may, you may. Oh, there's no songs listed. Here they are. Uh, the songs on here you might recognize. Pleasure was one that was. Uh, that was on their greatest hits. The other ones, you're, you're probably not going to recognize them, but you know, Rod Argent was uh, a few years out of the Zombies. He formed this band with Russ Ballard, who's written a bazillion songs. Yeah. Bazillion songs that other people have covered. You usually, you got to know at least one Russ Ballard, even if you don't know who he is. But anyway, Argent, Ring of Hands, 1971. My honorable mention. My honorable mention would be Blue Cheer, and um, this is Old Pleasant Hope with a nice, uh, what do you call that? Quilt. Quilt cover. Yeah. Uh, okay, this series is called Hard and Heavy, and the reason we dropped this one from our top 25, not because we don't like it, because I actually love this record. Yep. It's just... It's basically a folk album. Compared to, you know, those early albums where they were just loud. I mean, yeah. they, there was a... I don't want to say they were heavy, but they were loud. There was something loud about them. Yeah. This is more... <laughs> mellow. <laughs> yeah, and there was a big folk movement in the early 70s. I mean, it started with Dylan, obviously, in the 60s, but when the band put out music from the Big Pink, a lot of bands wanted to sound that way, and I think this, this probably was one of the yeah. one of the responses to that album. So you even have like country rock on here, which yep. the, the, which actually that there's the, the inspiration for the cover because yeah. that song is kind of a country rock song. Yeah. And then you have uh, what else I wrote on here? Eco blues, like a, this is your politically charged rocker. And yeah, then, environmental uh, concerns. That was huge yeah. in seven. I'm the light, and that's kind of that's like almost a throwback to the '60s on this record. So there same, you go. same band that did Summertime Blues, the loudest, louder than God band. Yep. And here they're doing more acoustic. So there you go, music. that's uh Blue Cheer. Yep. And um, that's my pick for well, not my pick. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable mentions. Honorable anyway. mentions I got it. Alright, we're gonna get into just the meat of the of nineteen seventy one, the hard the harder edged music. Um, again, the name of the series is hard and heavy. Not hard rock, heavy metal, just hard and heavy. That's the kind of sounds that we're into. This is the stuff that was definite, definite roots of the heavier stuff that came later. So we've got Nantucket Sleigh Ride by Mountain, Leslie West's uh, power trio, and the uh, you know the this title track on here, great one. Everyone knows it, classic rock staple, really. Uh, what's the other one on here that was my? Oh, this isn't the one I was thinking it was. Still a great album. Yeah. <laughs> I was probably thinking of climbing that had never in my life on it, but this was the one either right before it or right after. I think it was before. And he had such a brilliant, heavy, nasty guitar tone. He did, and his voice too. Yeah. Really, he had a real growly voice and just a great band. Very overlooked, I think. I think so. By fans and fans of early head rock, not head rock, early hard oh, rock. Mm -hmm. You know, Mississippi Queen. A lot of people. That's the only song they oh, know by. Know. Yeah. I saw them at concert opening up for Triumph um, in the '80s. And they were fantastic. And for uh, Mississippi Queen, they bought a giant cowbell. I mean, just monstrous <laughs> spinal tap. The original cowbell. The original don't, cowbell don't, song. Don't, don't, don't. Oh yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> All right, keeping on it. This is a uh, bottom of the list. This one almost didn't make her cut either. Yep. This one made it in at the last second because the budget didn't make it in, basically. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, Blood Rock Three, 
Definitely not as heavy as the first two Blood Rocks. When you think of Blood Rock, what's the first song you think of? DOA. DOA. You know, that's that heavy, scary, one of the scary scariest rock. songs ever written. Exactly. And uh, mm. this uh, this album, definitely not that uh, that same bit of um, bit of scariness, but um, but it's still they've got a they've got kind of a signature sound. Yes. Um, you recognize the singer when he comes in, and it's it's them. They they write good early '70s hard rock. And that, that the song Whiskey Vengeance. Yep. Definitely has that. Uh, that heavy, um, doomy, spooky vibe that you got, you know, from DOA. But instead of the guitars creating that sound, it's more of the, the organs and the keyboards as opposed to right. right. But Which yeah. really, DOA was kind of that way too. Blood Rock Three. I always like the cover too. I know it's real simple. And they had boring, interesting but, covers. They did. Uh, but, some of them are kind of disturbing. Yeah. Blood Rock USA, the one after this one, has this weird cartoon weird picture cartoon of, with it. Yeah. of a guy's finger pointed at his head, but it's a gun, gun. and the bullet's coming out of his it. finger, and, and the blood's just, it's just very bizarre. bizarre. But yeah. Even for the time, it was bizarre. This is, but this one's simple, very different, but I, yeah. you know, I've always kind of liked it, anyhow, so many of Cool stuff. Yeah, Blood Rock 3. All right, one of my favorites, Overlooked yes, Bands, yes, yes. Definite Proggy, Wishbone Ash. Uh, this is the Pilgrimage album. Um, Came right before Argus, right? Yeah, the one right before Argus. Argus. This is their second album. Um, there was there was also a live EP that was in here either before or after this one, but it was most it was promotional, so it never was officially released. Live stuff, four songs. Um, instrumental opener on this is called Vas Des. Great, very very progressive. Um, a little bit heavier than what they went on to do on Argus. Jailbait's another one that's a real real memorable one. It's a great album. I mean, Wishbone Ash is one of those bands that I didn't... I'd been checking out the album for years. I saw the Argus album for like years and years. Like, that looks really cool. But I never bought it for some reason. And I got into them way late, but I love them. I freaking love this band. They're awesome, and everything you hear, they just have a certain sound. So that if you like a lot of it, you're going to like most of what they do. Especially those first three, four albums. They're just... Yep. Each one is just... Everything up to... Next. I think everything up to Wishbone 4, which would have been their fifth album because they had the live one in there too, uh, it was the original group. And I think after that they started to splinter. But those first four or five albums are definitely... I also think they're one of those underrated bands because they don't get the credit they get they they don't. deserve for... I mean, that, that twin guitar sound that you got from Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and all those metal bands... Oh yeah, you can hear you can hear Lizzie all over this. You, you yep. know they were fans, and Iron Maiden definitely were fans of Wishbone Ash. Yep, definitely. So, for sure. There you go, Wishbone Ash. All right. Nazareth, yes. first album from Nazareth. Uh, it's a diverse and pretty heavy rocking album for 1971. Odd because their very next album is very folksy. <laughs> yeah, was it uh, Exercises? Yes, Exercises. Yeah. And yeah. this one, they, and they seem to do that. You know, they have a heavy album. Nazareth is weird. Heavy album. They are kind of weird. But this that. album was, was a fairly heavy album, and uh, to me, it was kind of a, a stylistic mix of. Um, I don't know. It's kind of it kind of went in with the first couple of Led Zeppelin albums, as far as not that it sounds like Led Zeppelin, but the same kind of stylistic mix. Yeah. We have the acoustic, you know, rock, and then you have the heavier rock stuff, and you have the early metal stuff, which is what makes that stuff interesting to listen to. I mean, even the cover is kind of that. It's got that same kind of feel as the mm -hmm. Zeppelin cover, the black and white with the color logo. Yep. It's just interesting. Yep, this is one of those early out and the back, I always thought the back was kind of cool. I actually like the back cover better. I think, <laughs> yeah, it, it tricked me. I found a copy that had this as the front, front cover. Yeah, and I was looking at it going, did I just never notice this or what? I didn't. It's trippy, huh? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a trippy it's cover. Two sets, two of, sets eyes. of eyes. Yep. But yeah, I mean, this is you know, this is a precursor to what became the behemoth known as heavy metal. Yep. So there you go. Nazareth. Yep. First album. They're from, uh, they're a mm -hmm. Scottish fan. Yes. Scottish? McCaffrey. Yep. All right, we've got one another one of my favorites. We've got Humble Pie, Rock On. Uh, the ones that were on this one, Shine On. This is while Frampton was still in the band. So uh, a lot of his vocals are still prominent. I mean, Steve Marriott was the main singer, but Humble Pie were one of those bands, and they were real common in the 70s where all the members sang. I mean, Kiss did that. Humble Pie was the precursor to that, really. Uh, you don't see that so much anymore. You, you know, any one of the members could have taken, except maybe the drummer, uh, could have taken lead vocals at any point, and you still knew it was them because they all had very characteristic voices. So Frampton's all over this. He sang Shine On. Uh, another one on here that is very, uh, very well known Humble Pie track is uh, Stone Cold Fever, and that's Steve Marriott all over the place. <clears throat> we also got Rolling Stone on here, which is the Muddy Waters um, cover, which is super heavy, super 
awesome heavy track for the time. I think any of the early heavy and hard rock stuff always is inspired by that early blues stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So great album. Any really any of the humble pie stuff you can't go wrong with. They are often overlooked. Really a super group from the seventies and and went on to do stuff that you probably have heard of. But this is this is where it came from. Steve Marriott was one of the greatest singers in the seventies that you've never heard. Yep. I mean, you probably heard 30 Days in the Hole, but man, he, that guy could sing like a few others. Before I show the next one and even that one, please don't anybody post below and say, uh, that band, Humble Pie is not heavy metal. Oh, dude, if you didn't have, I mean, that, that was the heavy stuff of the time. Right, and I understand Seven that. And, and, this, and this next band we're going to show definitely wouldn't be considered heavy metal in the slightest. But this is Yes, the Yes album. And if you don't think there's a heaviness to Yes with the quality of the songwriting, the depth of the the um, arrangements and the uh -huh. musical theory and the lyrics and all that. I mean, these guys are heavy. They're not mm -hmm. sound wise. They're not heavy, but oh my god! I, I don't even think they're got heaviest in their sound. I mean, Chris Squire's bass. Yeah, that that, that growling Rickenbacker. Rick and yep. bass. The Rick and bastard. <laughs> and R.I.P. Chris Squire. We lost him since the yeah, last set of videos. Yes, we did. We did. And, uh, and this, uh, I don't know. What a great album. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's not a bad song on here. Steve Howe's first one. Yep. First one to Steve Howe, the guitar player. This is where on. Yes really develop that sound yep. that has been copied by yep. tons of other bands. They're, they were one of those bands, there's a lot of bands in the early 70s, that their first couple albums they didn't really do anything. They, they and were, even to, yeah, today, they were still searching. Yeah. Yeah. Yes was no exception. I mean, um, they did a lot of covers on their first two albums, but they hadn't really found their sound yet. Yeah, Alice Cooper did the same thing. A lot of those prog bands too, like, mm -hmm. like Genesis, same thing. Their right. early albums were kind of poppy and you know, then they started getting into progressive. Mm -hmm. Even Pink Floyd. I mean, True. they, you know, well, I mean, with Pink Floyd, we've got, you know, the whole Sid Barrett, Sid Barrett aspect, thing, and right. that was part of it, but, but with Yes, they definitely, oh man, their, their signature sound was born right really there. on this album. Yep. I mean, but this is, this is like, this read almost reads like a greatest hits by itself. Yep. Yours is No Disgrace, Clap, which is the acoustic guitar solo, which is just draw dropping. Yep. Uh, Starship Trooper, which is just unearthly song. Um, I've seen all good people. That, that's yeah. That's the yes song that I get introduced. Adventure to. and perpetual change. There's not. It's yeah, just, those are probably the two deepest cuts on it. Are those two? But really, you can't go wrong with this album. But even perpetual change is. I mean. Yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah, this is great yeah. album. Great band. And like I said, uh, I, I, I mean, we decided to show this one because of the things we already said, but mostly because Chris Squire, his bass sound. Yeah. Unearthly, heavy, growling, yeah. Rickenbacker, Rickenbastard yeah, for sure. All right, next one, another precursor to the whole heavy metal that we've all come to know and love, or at least the one that Scott and I grew up with. I know that today's metalheads will call it something completely different. <laughs> and we've also got the prog element in here. We've got Uriah Heep with their second album, Salisbury. Uh, we've got the UK cover over here and the American one here. And I think the only difference between them is one song. Once, yeah, I know, and we should have looked it up before we started. <laughs> uh, I'm almost positive it's... Oh, crap, can't see it on that one. Oh, what is it? What is it? It might be Lady in Black. Let's just take a look real quick. Yeah, let's. So this one's got the, the tank cover with the band on it. I mean, the covers couldn't be more different. Lady in Black's here. Okay, Bird of Prey is on the UK one, and it's not on uh, the US one. So Correct. it's High, no, High Priestess is on there. Salisbury, The Bullet. Which park. one is it? The Park on there? The Park is on here. Time to Live. Time to Live. Lady in Black. What is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> What's the song? Why can't I see one it? One of these things ain't like the other. <laughs> one of these things doesn't want. High Priestess is on here. Salisbury. has got to be on there, right? Yeah, Salisbury. Lady in Black. Park. The Park. Time to Live. Time to Live. Lady in Black. Yep. Simon the Bullet Freak. There That's it is. the one. Simon the, the Bullet, Bullet Freak. Freak. <laughs> Durr. Yeah, that, that's a difference one. So this one, well, this one doesn't have it. Here's the uh, the gatefold too. So Bird of Prey on this one, Simon the Bullet Freak on this one. Yep. Both great songs. Um, covers, again, I don't know who did the covers. I'm not quite sure. This I one's got the, ba the got a guy, it's not even the band. It's, some, it's a soldier, a soldier yeah. commandeering a tank through a bunch of battle scenes. And this one is some it's kind of creature that's sketching of a, on, yeah. you know, like a bat. Human I actually like this one better. I always thought it was, it is. It was kind of bizarre. It's definitely more and of a heavy. The back cool too. This one's kind of boring. Yeah, I mean, Heap would do that. They, their first album had two different covers and two releases as well. But great heavy stuff. It's got that signature Hammond B3 that Ken Hensley was known yep. for. And, and I'm pretty sure Hensley wrote most of the material on this yeah. thing. So. And he, 
you know, these another similar band of these guys, same kind of lineup, same style as Deep Purple, but the, the, the organ sounds are totally different. Hensley's organ sounds completely different than John Lord's, and there's ways that he got that sound. That I've read interviews with him that he used to pack it with blankets in a certain way to get the sound that he got. And just like a guitar player, the way they get their tones. Alright, next up in our top 25. How did this not make top 5? Wow. <laughs> Mostly because it wasn't that heavy. It yeah, was just really I suppose. Not that heavy. This is early. And like we were, we were talking about earlier with bands not really finding their sound yet. Yeah. I mean, this is Thin Lizzy. Yeah, first Thin Lizzy. First three albums by Lizzy. And then also, this is the uh, New Day EP, which is came out right after right this. Right after yeah. Basically part of the same, you know, same session. That's really. Um, very folksy, Irish folksy. Yes. Um, but this is a power trio, highly influenced by the likes of Cream, Jimi Hendrix. Yep. Um, oh, Hendrix, big time. Big time. That's exactly. And, and Eric Bell was he was the original guitar player, unique sounding guitar player as you could have found. Really, yep. Very there's good. nobody I can think of that sounds like him since. Really. And this stuff, it, fortunately, this stuff didn't go over. Right. And Brian Downey. Brian Downey's just. He's a He's, he's got to be one of the Probably. most underrated drummers ever. Yeah, he'd be number one on my underrated drummers yep. list. He's for sure. Right awesome. next to Joey Kramer, probably. I mean, was anybody doing the actual double bass beat before before him in, in hard rock and metal? Maybe John Bonham. Maybe. Maybe him. That's about it. But did, Bonham, did Bonham play a double two basses? No. I don't yeah. think so, yeah. He didn't. Anyhow, this he is the... He just had a lot of good footwork, and Brian Downey did, too. This is the UK cover? Yeah, and this is the US the one, cover. which, you know, is a very... It's very sexy. Very sexy. But this what's is, wrong with being sexy? Ist. 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 Oh, well. Whatever. <laughs> She's got nice hips. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I like that cover better. I like them both. They're both cool. This one's the classic one, but they're both they're both great covers, really. Actually, I, mean, I like this cover. I think this cover's great. Yeah, and this was done by Rodney Matthews, too. So. Yeah, that's one of his earlier covers. Odd one. An odd one. This is a bootleg. I, I don't have the original, but it's, I don't it's either. still fresh. for it forever. <laughs> it's what it would be, if I ever find it, it would be a, help, a grail in my collection, that's for sure. Yeah. That shows up on eBay. That's I don't think there's any even one song on here that anybody would like know as like a hit. Um, remembering, maybe only because there's so many compilations called Remembering. Um, but yeah, I don't know. No, there's just there's just not. It's just I enjoy listening but to the it's, albums it's, the back. But. Yeah, I mean, I it took it took a little bit. The reason I got into these first three albums was because there was a uh, a compilation that came out in '86 called The Collection which was a whole series that came out on Castle Music out of England. Yeah. And it was just a compilation of these first three albums. That's the only reason I got I think the one I bought was what was called Remembering, and that's what got me into these That's one of them. Yeah. But I mean, I, I became was, a, was a two fan. Part. Yeah. It was the red one and the blue one was Saga of the Aging Orphans, which Correct. is all the same uh, tracks that are on these first three albums with a couple of you know, B-sides yeah. kind of things. And I mean, I, of course, I got into Thinly like a lot of guys did, you know, it was Jailbreak, you know, Jailbreak, Boys Live, back in Live Dangerous, yeah. and I was like, I just became an instant fan. Then, of course, then you start going backwards. I gotta find this. I gotta find that. And some people do. Some people hear boys are back in town and they're happy. That's good enough. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> not I either. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of my favorites. I love these guys. And again, I got into them late. Hawkwind, second album, In Search of Space. I got two copies here. Uh, that one is on. This is on Liberty. Liberty. This is a Japanese copy. This one's on United Artists. This is the original pressing, and it comes with a die cut. Yes, cover which is, is not. It's just a gatefold. Yeah, it's like a puzzle, and it comes apart. And then you got the little guys in there. This little guy right there. It's a little guy. <laughs> and then it's got the inside spaceship hawk wind. Um, and it came with a with a um, program too. Don't look at the back cover because there's a hawk lady. Yes, yeah, Stacia is back there. She's naked. She regularly would strip down and dance for the shows. Yep. Not in a pornographic way, but in a very '60s hippie it interpretive was, it was dance. Art, it was an art thing. I mean, it really was. And she had. I know some people won't understand that, but it really was. It was very artistic, and I, I heard interviews with her. She would paint up, and it's like she really was interpreting the music. And there were chemicals galore flowing. Of course, trust. I mean, I, I don't know for her specifically, but the guys in the band. Yeah. Like, of course, this would be the first album for Lemmy. Actually, he or came in, he played on Silver Machine, which I think was a B-side on one of these trip singles, but he wasn't on the album. So he toured for this album, though, or? Maybe. I'm not sure. Some I think he thing. came towards the end of the whole uh, In Search of Space. But, yeah, Silver Machine, which was one of their biggest singles, which I don't right. think was on an album. I think Silver Machine is on the CD version of this. Could be. Yeah, it is. It is a bonus track on that. So. In hindsight, he kind of is present, but uh, he didn't make a full appearance until the next one, which is Dory Me for Solo. And this is totally not hard rock. No, no, no. This is. In fact, rock. it took me twice to get into Hawkman. The first time was in '91, 
and I was looking for anything that was Sabbath related. I'd never heard Hawkwind. The, the titles and the, and the names sort of like, oh, I bet you they have a Sabbathy vibe somewhere in there. Nope. Not even close. <laughs> I wasn't ready for them in '91. Um, I I discovered them when was it? Probably about 2006 or five. Yeah, you were just on a Hawkwind. Oh, oh big time! Kick and because I read the book, the book that Michael Moorcock wrote, the guy who wrote the Elric Saga. He wrote a, a, a fictional story called Time of the Hawk Lords, which is based around the guys in the band being right. kind of like a superhuman characters. Way before Kiss did it with their comic book, Hawkwind had a, had a science fiction book written about them as kind of like saviors of the world kind of a thing. And it really, that's what really propelled me into I kind of think of them as a band. prog rock band, but it, as a what? Prog rock. Oh yeah, they're progressive. They, there was a whole genre, subgenre called space rock. Space rock, point. yeah. And these guys are definitely the... Uh, the kings of that whole thing but yeah it's progressive for sure the thing that's cool about Hawkwind and especially the early stuff is very long titles that were kind of they had kind of these chants that they would sing over and over and over and it was getting to this kind of hypnotic kind of space um, which I mean as far as like trippy you mean kind of like modern churches when they sing the same chorus over and over again <laughs> maybe oh, okay. they did have an album called the church oh, sorry, I, I didn't say that on video did I? <laughs> I could go on for hours and hours about Hawkman. I think they're just friggin' great. Um, it's very trippy. It's very drug related, but you know you don't have to be in drugs to on drugs to appreciate. Hawkman for me is, is I got to be in a headspace for it. True. You know, what? but if you are, there's it's nothing awesome. else it'll do. Yep. Nothing exactly. else to do because they're pretty damn you unique. It's just that certain headspace. You sit. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way with the early Pink Floyd too. I love the early Pink Floyd stuff, but I got to be in the mood for it. Yeah. You know. And I think with Hawkman, I've always called them the British Grateful Dead. Not because they sound like the Grateful Dead, but they have the same kind of rabid following. Yes. And they've got tons upon tons of live material out there, either in bootleg form or reissued. That's ridiculous. Oh, it's ridiculous. I, I didn't even try. And some, and some of it is like like the same show's been released with like 16 different names. Yes. Like, yeah. Some, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, like I said, I heard this before. Yeah, somebody yeah. got the rights to this <laughs> album and re-released it. And yeah. Whatever. All right. Great band. All right, next up in our list, this is... Uh, Jimi Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix. Cry Love. This is a posthumous album. Posthumous? Was that the first one? I believe it was. It may have been the first one that was probably closest to the track listing that ended up being, that was supposed to be First Rays of the New Rising Sun. Right, would have been a, the, the new album from Jimi Hendrix, right. but they were unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, someone came in and finished them, if I'm not mistaken. Was it Jack Douglas? I believe it was. We need to look. It was the look. Aerosmith producer. And then a, and a lot some, of... Uh, some, one of the guys did some really shitty stuff with these releases. There were three or four of them. Uh, Crash Landing, Midnight Lightning, I think was the other one, and there's another. One of the guys went and added his own music to them, I believe, which was Billy Cox on bass, um, Steve Winwood. Doesn't doesn't say it. I don't know. Either. Doesn't it? Doesn't it's it's it, still pretty cool. It's I, I kind of wonder though, would Jimmy have released this material like this? I doubt it. No. Uh, a lot so. of this material showed up on other albums too. Yep. Um, but I'm like pretty the, sure uh, all of these tracks ended up. When, when his father finally got control of the estate and he put out First Rays of the New Rising Sun, I think most of those most titles of those were on. Yep. So they were, they were earmarked for that album that Jimmy was working on. And then, if I'm not mistaken, did a couple of these songs end up on the uh, Rainbow Bridge album too? Probably. Because Rainbow Bridge was like a soundtrack. soundtrack the movie, the movie yeah. was friggin' awful. <laughs> the Hendrix scenes were great, but there was a story in it. There was all of these hippies, like to the nth degree, talking about their mm. stuff, and it's like, wow, it's yeah, hard, to watch. hard to watch. Exactly. <laughs> you know, other movies like that, then getting off subject, like we always do. But um, the Sgt. Pepper movie. Oh, the, the, the one they did later, later? yeah, the Frampton Four. Awful, but I love the Aerosmith scene. The soundtrack was <laughs> far better than the movie. And the Aerosmith scene was awesome. You got, you got the band up there. Or the yep. the uh, what were they called? Uh, they were villains. I can't remember what the name the, of the band. Yeah, the something villain band, and, and uh, that's just cool. And then they, they killed Steven Tyler, and they, they killed Frampton too. And, <laughs> well, they don't kill him really, I guess, because he was Frampton as Billy Shears, right? I, you know, to be honest, I don't think I've ever seen that movie. I've seen it. I have it on DVD. Familiar with the music? Watching the whole thing, it's, it's pretty difficult. I the watched... future villain band. That's it. Okay. So anyhow, so here you. We're getting totally off subject. Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> Heavy pretty record. Cool. One of the uh, kind not of really. Very unauthorized, easy. one of the first unauthorized. I think there was about four, and there was a ton of bootleg Hendrix crap that was out yep. there. Stephanie was playing with Otis Redding. Stephanie was playing with uh, the Jimmy James and the Famous Flames. That kind of all that stuff. And none that, of that stuff has that Hendrix sound because he didn't really right. find that sound it was before. Yet. Yep, it was but it's before. people just capitalizing on his name basically yep. after he Pretty died. Much. But this album actually sounds like Hendrix. It has that really raunchy, heavy guitar tone that he had. Um, yep. 
there's some, I mean, well-known songs too. Freedom, Easy Rider, those all um, were well-known. Angel yep. is a big one. My favorite's Belly Button Window, is, which is a song that doesn't really appear too often, but it's, it's written from the perspective of a baby in its mother's belly looking through the belly, belly button, button window. <laughs> And it's talking about, you know, mom and dad, do you really want me? It's kind of a sad song, actually, but it's cool. It's, I mean, from the perspective only Jimi Hendrix really could come up with. And if you want to see the roots of hard rock and heavy metal, right oh, there. Yeah. Hendrix, there's no denying it. I mean, yeah. Was he it? No. But he was the, the beginning roots. of it. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And that, and his this power trio that he was in for, you know, with the experience, everybody in the early 70s was trying to be a power trio. Oh, like, yeah. And, and then show, the same we thing. We showed several of them already. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, Mountain was yep. the one. Um, the it, same with Band of Gypsies, really. It was the same kind of setup. It was at least what it came to. Yep. Finn Lizzie, also another power trio. Yep. And there's something about it. There's something about that kind of event. Here's another one. A little bit different instrumentation by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Talk about a power trio. I mean, we didn't have really. We had drums, we had manic keyboard organ player. And then we had Greg Lake, who was kind of went between acoustic guitar and bass, and but not really a specific bass player or guitar player. It's just Greg, and he was the vocalist too. Tarkus was their second album, and the first album was was proggy, but this one, oh man, they took off with it. And talk about Yes being proggy. These guys were like a couple levels above Yes with the progressive stuff. Uh, Tarkus is was like a twenty. I think it was like a 22 minute piece, it was the it was the side one of the album, total just part after part after part, mm -hmm. time changes and all that. A lot of jazz influences in Very. Yep. Um, and it's some. It's about this, um, <laughs> it's it's a funny little story about, that involves this, little character this character the that looks like an armadillo but he's kind of a tank and his name's Tarkus and he comes up against this monster called the Manticore and he goes swimming and it's just this story it's just this is long drawn out story about this creature and, and it was not inspired by drugs at all i, I have no idea i don't know if elp <laughs> were a drug using band know. or not but the prog guys were so I have a hard time believing any band in the 70s were uh, not doing were something not, with yeah. drugs yeah. yeah but great album um it's definitely a little harder to listen to than like you know brain salad surgery or something but it's definitely the beginnings of that and I always love the color of the cover. It's just got all kinds of cool colors in it, and it's a neat drawing of something you've never seen before, an armadillo tank. Yep. So, gotta love it. All right, next up, uh, this is um, a band who was huge in the 70s. Huge. And all but forgotten these days for some reason. Other than, you know, a few classic rock songs that get played sparsely on classic rock radio. Yeah. I, well, I don't understand. This band was huge. Um, they were. They sold out stadiums, you know, they multiple were. nights in a row. They were, they were, I think they fell in the cracks of the very early 70s. Because what happened later in the 70s just overshadowed it so much. I think yep. that they got lost in that. So who are we talking about? Grand Funk. Grand Funk. And they were Grand Funk on this one, not Grand Funk Railroad. Yep. Grand Funk. Mark Farner, guitar player on this album. Yep. Okay. Uh, just had his own style, his own sound. Um, great guitar player and also a great singer. He had, yes, he had more of the... Uh, the R&B influences like Aretha Franklin that he was coming from. That's the kind of singer he was. Really clean, high-pitched, uh, very strong and kind guys, of tenor voice. And these guys get pretty poppy too at once in a while, but mm -hmm. I, I don't really think sur survival, I, I don't think I remember. There's any songs that were really, uh, I wanted to show these two because it's here. Show them inserts. Stuff. 70s were great for inserts too. Um, Kiss definitely capitalized on it, but Grand Funk was doing it. Uh, they had color 8 by 10s of each of the band members in the uh, like the cavemen kind of yep. motif. Look on the cover. Pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool, yeah. I mean And Mark Mark Farner had like the longest, straightest hair of any I just thought he looked so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So cool. I like uh, you kinda of, their original uh, producer on this was Terry Knight. He was the guy that was kinda he was responsible for the real heavy, loud sounds that they had on all those earlier albums from the on time album the Grand Funk album, Survival, there were like a series of three or four of them that when he was producing them they just had this sound, it was pushed into the red, it was very overdriven and 
and just loud in a certain way. And it, it was the thing that some of these songs jam pretty well too. There's yeah. a the, the, I don't remember the times, but it, yeah, the there was a couple songs on here were at least close to eight nine minutes long. Well, they did the uh, "Give Me Shelter" of the Stones cover, which you know nobody can really reproduce that, but they did a pretty good they did version. A pretty of good it. job, yeah. And then, but I could feel them in the morning, almost yep. uh, almost eight minutes long. Uh, feeling me. all right was a uh, Joe Cocker cover. That's right. Yeah. Which you know that's what Mark Farner was into. That kind of that kind of blue eyed soul kind of thing. R and B. Yeah. yeah. That's definitely uh, yeah. And yeah, Brad Funk, Mark Farner. Awesome. Awesome record. All right, another one of my favorites. We have <clears throat> the uh, bands from the UK that were really into the blues. You know the biggest ones, you know Cream, you know Zeppelin, uh, John Mayall's Blues Breakers, the Yardbirds, all that stuff. Well, Free was another one that were right in the thick of all that blues sounding hard rock that was coming out of the UK in the 70s. Um, Paul Rogers was the singer, one of my favorite singers ever. Uh, you know him. He went on to Bad Company. Bad Company. He went on to The Firm with with Jimmy Dear Page. Page. Yep. Went on to do solo stuff. The Queen. You, yeah, that one I still don't get, nor have I heard. <laughs> I, I just don't want to. It's two bands that mean, two people, two, a band and a person that means so much to me. I'm so scared. It's It would suck so bad. It's, yeah, it's I would bizarre. Listen. <laughs> I, I don't, when you think of, you know, like, just manly, badass singers, that's... And, you know, and then you think and Queen. It wasn't so much that. No, it was something just, it was just as different. lovable. It was just but different. It was totally yeah. different. Yeah, Paul Rogers and Queen is not something I would have put together. No, but it was. But he did it. So yeah, anyhow, he did it. And this this live album, and it also has a couple of studio cuts on it, like B sides, like uh, I think uh, Ride on Pony and My Brother Jake. But it's just live versions of the songs that they'd already had made famous on the albums previous. Um, just there's done a, live. There's a tragic guitar stuff. player there too, man. Yeah, Paul speaking, of, speaking of drugs. Okay, who do we have here? So we got Paul Kossoff, um, great guitar player, just a little guy. Uh, they did all this stuff. He died in 76, I believe, of a brain hemorrhage. Yeah. Something like that. But, you know, drugs are obviously part of the picture. Part of the picture, yeah, for sure. Uh, Paul Rogers went on to form Bad Company with drummer Simon Kirk. And then Andy Frazier went on to do a bunch of other stuff. We just lost him last year. Um, I don't remember how he died. Was that two years ago? I don't know. Maybe it was. Last it year. wasn't quite two years ago because I still I did a, a radio show tribute on the day he died. I can't remember how he died, but he, you know he was he was sixty ish. Um, great band. Wow. And Andy Fraser was like seventeen, eighteen when he was in this band, and you cannot. His bass playing was so. It stood out so much that it's just like wow, who is this kid? He was. He was literally just a kid. Great band. Any free album that you can get your hands on, especially the first three or four, including this live one. Especially if you're a big Bad Company fan. I mean, oh yeah, because the stuff Rogers was doing with them was so much grittier than what he did with Bad Company. You can hear some of his songwriting was starting that piano stuff that oh, he started yeah, you can doing. Definitely hear it. But the first two or three albums, guitar-driven, heavy blues, and Paul Rogers is all over it. Just uh, incredible. 